Fibre Arts Take Two are excited to be back this week with the final Friday feature artist season for 2021. There is an amazing lineup of fibre and mixed media artists to share with you all. And we couldn't think of anyone better to kick us off than the wonderful Tamara Russell. Tamara is a Melbourne based textile artist specialising in free machine embroidery, hand stitching and mending. Tamara's practice engages with the natural environment, recreating the images and shapes in embroidered works in both 2D and 3D forms. Using photos as the starting point, she transfers her subject matter directly onto fabric, painting with thread. This work allows Tamara the freedom to portray her concerns around social issues, including the environment, climate change, and the treatment of asylum seekers in Australia. I'm sure you'll agree with Tamara that fibre art is the perfect conduit for expressing our deepest inner thoughts through the meditative nature of machine or slow hand stitching with textiles. Working with found materials, Tamara finds the joy in the unexpected, which is evident in her captivating textile kintsuki vessels that we can't wait to hear more about during this interview. Tamara's work has been exhibited in Australia and the United Kingdom. She is the founder of the NAM Textile Collective, an artist-led organisation aiming to incorporate and challenge the boundaries of textile arts. Tamara has recently been working with the collective on their upcoming group exhibition called Stitching Change. I'm sure you can't wait to learn more about Tamara's work and this wonderful exhibition. If you're joining us live, we invite you to ask Tamara questions about her work or her process by simply leaving a comment below. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming textile artist Tamara Russell. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> It was very nice. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, we enjoyed putting them together and finding the right music. And um, yeah, it, it, it just feels really lovely to do that for people. So, um, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Fantastic. We've got plenty of people watching live. That's fantastic. Hello, everybody. Um, lovely to be back. This is our first live in a while. We took three weeks off to, to hang out with the kids and, uh, you know, do other work <laughs> as well. Um, but it's lovely to see some familiar faces. So hello, Vicky. Lovely to see you. Um, and Eva. Hi, beautiful Eva from Sweden. Eva's one of our um, beautiful students and she loves coming live as well. So that's really great. Oh, wow, from the South. Hi, Susan, from the South Island in New Zealand. Gorgeous. Oh, and Anne, Anne Billinson, hello. Really excited, fantastic. Oh, and the gorgeous Ursula. Hello, Ursula. Um, our students will know Ursula. She's our community liaison and she helps all our students out. She's absolutely fabulous. So um, lovely to see your face. <laughs> oh, hello. How do we pronounce that? Yeah. Aiki? Aiki? Have I got that wrong? Hi from Melbourne. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, beautiful. Susan Pepper, hello. Even a friend from India, hello. And Fiona Rainford, hello, darling, Fiona. We have got so many people joining in. This is fantastic, fantastic, all over the world. But Tamara, you're from Melbourne. How, yes. how are you going? How are you coping? Longest lockdown ever in the world history, like we were world <laughs> like that's something to be proud of. <laughs> well, you know, we're not the, the most, um, what is it, livable city now, so we're in the most lockdown. Hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's great because for me it's fantastic. You get more studio time because you're not trying to get anywhere. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of the artists we talk to say the same thing. They say, you know, it, it, it you know, having some downtime has been great for their creative practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do envy the people in the UK and, and the USA now that we see they're, they're putting their feelers out and they're going to festivals and um, 
and going on holidays. <laughs> going on holidays, I know. Well, it won't be long for us. I, I feel that there's um, it's just just beyond our reach at this point, but it's yeah. getting closer. <laughs> It really is. It really is. Well, thank you for spending your time with us tonight. I'm really excited to talk. Oh, no, to lovely. Thank you. For, yeah. me. for people that aren't familiar, and I'm not that familiar actually with your background, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into textile art and um, your journey into to being a professional artist. Uh, so I had a mother who was incredibly creative and would try absolutely everything. You name a craft and she tried it. And so from, you know, in my teens, she was helping me learn to sew clothes. Um, and that was kind of my starting point was sewing my own clothes because back in the day before you had all the fast fashion, you either had to buy stuff from the sports girl or make your own. Um, and so she taught me to do that. And then from there, um, I lived in the UK for a long time. So... I met some fantastic textile artists over there, one of whom taught me how to free machine embroider. Um, and it kind of opened up this world for me. Um, I also joined the spinners and weavers because I've spun since I was in my teens. Um, but I learned to weave and that was just eye-opening. I loved it. Um, I got looms, I did rugs, I did so many things. Uh, but when we moved back to Australia, my loom stayed in England because it was so big. Um, and from there, I went in much more into my machine embroidery rather than the weaving side and have just had a great time ever since. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah. That sounds amazing. <laughs> oh, that would have been hard to leave your big loom behind. Have you ever thought about getting one here? It was. Uh, yeah, I, I did actually. Um, I lived in Canberra for a while when we came back because... Um, my background is actually in energy efficiency and sustainable living. Um, so, yeah, I got a loom while I was in Canberra, um, but it, they take up so much room. I like big floor loom. Uh, yeah. So my one in England, I could never replicate. It was a very old dryad. It was just the most beautiful thing. And here I got a much newer uh, Swedish loom. And I just didn't have that same, I don't know, Oompa <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, and and I and I kind of have moved on, you know. Like um, I spent a lot of time making all sorts of things, scarves, using silks, and all sorts of beautiful things in the UK and rugs. And then now it's just kind of I don't know. I'm one of those people who my practice keeps evolving; it doesn't stay the same. Um, yeah. So a jack of all trades, master of none, probably comes to mind. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> I think dabbling, not that I think that your work is dabbling at all, but like that whole notion of, you know, that that's a bad thing to dabble or that's a bad thing to be a jack of all trades. I actually don't think it's a bad thing. I think yeah. it's liminal. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It means that you can be so adaptive and then we'll get probably get to it later on, but I'm sure that the techniques that you've taken from one aspect of your learning and development you can create and evolve into something else because of that oh, yeah. yeah yeah and yeah. I still use my weaving when I'm teaching people to mend and darn things and I create other things through weaving just in smaller you know I'm not doing the big rugs and things anymore but that's okay it's fine yeah so. yeah I, when when I was looking at your website, it is really diverse. So you've got bags, you've got jewellery, you've got vessels, you've got uh, textile art as, you know, sort of flat-framed pieces. It, it, is, it is a little treasure trove in there. It's great. <laughs> well, it's kind of working out how to use up all of the bits. So if I make an artwork, um, you end up obviously with little bits left over or if I make a bag, it's the bits are left over. So it was making sure that, I was using up a complete thing. So, um, you know, for a while I got a lot of upholstery sample pieces and I was using those to create handbags and things which went into making jewellery because I'd get all the offcuts. So, like, you know, these little earrings are upholstery offcuts and then I machine embroider on them and use bits and pieces of beads, um, precious stones, whatever I find often in charity shops or people throwing out in the street or wherever I find it. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of using up the complete, not throwing anything away, yeah. um, much to the chagrin of my children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, Vicky absolutely agrees that she wants to do all the things as well. Good on you, Vicky. I think it's important to, yeah, I love a dabbler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dabbler as well. Our um, dining room table currently looks like two sewing machines, eco dyeing. Um, I think there's some earth pigments on there as well on a big drop sheet. We never eat at the table because there's always something going yeah, on. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was wonderful. So as your children move out of home, you can take over their bedrooms, you see. So my studio is now. I used to have an external studio, but once the kids moved out, I've now got my home studio, which is lovely. So. Yeah, that's the good. dining room table tends to be used more as a cutting table, but yeah, yeah I bring everything back into the studio. So yeah, I loved how you said that your mum was one of the influences um, from a young age because the, the reason our sewing machines are out is my mum was a beautiful dressmaker and she tried to teach me how to sew for years and I just never really got it. I'm left-handed, I'm dyslexic. I just, you know, I just never quite got got it. And but I grew up with patterns and sewing machines and you know 15 years of calisthenics and costumes and seed beads and you know mum made all our um bridesmaids dresses and she never made a wedding dress though um but on the weekend last weekend she brought her sewing machines over and I pulled my one out that I've had in storage <laughs> and we she was teaching my daughter how to do it and I think I was just there as part of the process and I started making a little bag to put some natural brushes in like a uh, 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 yeah, I thought that would be something really simple. And it wasn't that hard and it was almost like all those, like that 20 years of my childhood growing up with mum, I just learnt through osmosis and I knew the sound of the sewing machine, the way it should sound and the click of the foot. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's because I'd spend, you know, mum would be doing it for hours. And it's something, you know, like a lot of people look at them as a scary item and they're not, you know, you just practice and... Mm. You know, yeah, your first seams might not be perfectly straight, but hey, you know, make the next one. It's fun. Yeah. It's like, yeah, my my children. So my eldest daughter, my mother taught her to sew, yeah. um, and then and she's never done, done it since. And uh, my middle one still sews, and the youngest, well, the youngest and the oldest just bring it home and dump it on my work table. And yeah, it just yeah. be happening. So. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lovely skill to pass on and and to make your children aware that you can do it. Yes, they don't have to go out and buy. It. And even if they choose not to, hopefully they'll come back to it when they have children. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm thoroughly enjoying it, and yeah, I, I I love your ethos around reusing and recycling and not wasting anything. And um, you, you know, you had a career in that, and now you continue that thread through your artwork. I think that's beautiful. Certainly something that we we admire here yeah yeah and I think it's really important I mean like you know nowadays a lot of my work I I, I live in Brunswick uh, so we have well it's gentrifying but we still have a high rental uh, market of group houses around here mm -hmm. and each time they rotate you know because all the stuff gets dumped on the street um. so you know a lot of my bowls bits and pieces clothing cut downs whatever I just go walking and pick it up off the street out of people's boxes they're putting out the front. Yeah. And during COVID, it's been really great because there's been some fantastic hauls. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, we know where to come next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we're hard waste, you know, because then people put out whole dinner services and things. Oh, and it's oh, I love it. hard waste. Yes. Yeah, and the yeah. op, shops, the op shops to be open again. Oh, I'm itching. Like, oh, yeah. that's That's been tough. Yeah, 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 definitely. I am also itching, really. Um, I have admired your vessels that you've been making. Um, I think since oh, well, I first discovered them in April last year, Noni, um, my mother in law, introduced me to your work, and I was like, oh my goodness, they're amazing. And that is your, and I'm going to try and get it right, but your text, your Kinsuki textile vessels, and they're just, yeah. they're just. Beautiful. Can you share with us the how they came about? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to stand up and grab it. Yeah. So, um, this was, I should have had it over here. This was a, a vase that I really liked and I dropped it. Um, and that was at the beginning of COVID last year. And I didn't want to actually throw it out. And I had this lovely eco dye silk that I'd had. So, um, there was a shirt factory in the city in Little Lonsdale Street and they shut down. 
and you could go in with a big shopping bag and take as much as you liked because they just wanted to get rid of it. They didn't want to pay to throw it out, um, which a friend had told me about. So I took masses and masses of pre-cut silk shirts, um, pieces, and then I did an eco dyeing course with a girlfriend and came up with this lovely silks and put the two together and then um, didn't, it was, it's sort of on that Japanese kintsugi idea of putting ceramics together with a gold glue. Yeah. Um, and instead of using glue, I, I stitched these, the, the silk over each piece that was broken. Um, some of the pieces I actually broke up a bit more to get more uh, smaller pieces and then just stitch them together and then um, used a black stitch with these ones. So these ones were, there's uh, four of them in this chatted series and they were to re represent the bushfires from yes. not last summer, the summer before. So, um, yeah, so they just kind of became, because there's these, I don't know if you can see there, the lovely leaves uh, from the eucalypts. So they kind of represented the fire, which is why I use black stitching. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of all appropriate at the time because we're just coming out of the fires. And then I kind of went through and started a series, I can show you here, where I, I went back to the traditional using, so these are using kimono silks that I actually had in a stash and then gold threads, so more the traditional gold kintsugi. But um, it just became fun. <laughs> and all these bowls that people were throwing out because they were broken, chipped, whatever, I'm yeah, like, well, I can use those. They're perfect. So yeah. um, it kind of just kept growing, and, and it's great fun. <laughs> oh my God. It, looks, it looks spectacular. And you know, Jenny, hello, darling. She says love these as well. Absolutely. But I mean, my you know, my repertoire is not huge. But I've never seen anything like that before. Had you seen anything like that before? Before you did it. Um, well, the, the Japanese kintsugi. So um, in, when I was in my teens, I went to school for a year in Japan yeah. um, and had seen the kintsugi and that sort of thing. And I thought, I, I don't know, you know, a brain dump or something. It was, I was actually originally going to try and glue them together and get gold. Yeah. Um, but we were in lockdown. So <laughs> it was nothing open. Um, and it was like, you know, I had this stuff. So I literally tried on this piece and really liked what it did um, and then kept wandering around and people were dumping all sorts of strange and wonderful pieces out in the street. So yeah. I just smashed them up with a hammer and went from there. And it's just great. It's um, you never know what's going to happen to the pieces. Mm. So, like, you know, this piece is missing some that was too shattered when I hit it. Uh, so I dropped this, but then I hit more pieces. So you end up with holes in it. And I really like that, that, you know, it's, you don't really control the whole process, but you turn it into whatever you want it to be. Um, and there was another piece. So this piece um, I had, so my sister passed away um, in 2019 from breast cancer. And this was a favourite bowl of hers, a Chinese bowl. And her partner had, and her had put this bowl out for the birds. They they live up in northern New South Wales, and so they put it out for water for the birds. And a magpie knocked it off, and it broke. Yeah. Um, so the lid hadn't been there, so it's still whole. And Tracy gave it to me um, and said, you know, it was one of Jen's favourite bowls. Did I want to use it? And so I kind of made it into this piece that kind of special about my sister Aww. so yeah this is one of those pieces that i will never get rid of but it was just really fun um you know creating it and bringing it back together and it was in her kind of favorite colors so Aww. and again it's you know it's um kimono silk off cuts so, and you can kind of yeah so it creates memories too but it's um yeah. it's fun I love that. I love that people know to give you things like that because you're someone special who will value them whether they're broken or not. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I've started accumulating things, you know, um, like, you know, this little dish was a friend was going to throw it out and said, oh, can you do anything with it? Um, so I put it back together and, you know, again, you can 
I don't think you can just see there, there's holes where it chips and, you know, with cheap ceramics, they just chip and you, you can't get it back because you get these tiny bits. So, and the holes are part of the joy of it. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I, I was quite addicted to mosaicing at one point in time. I think Daniel, do you remember my husband's in the background and he's, he's nodding his head. I took over the dining room table again. But this time with small bits of glass and we had, and then I think we had, as soon as my children started to crawl or my first baby started to crawl, I had to stop because. <laughs> Deadly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's, and it's so much joy to sort of find things, you know, like like old porcelains and things and make them into mosaics or do things with them. Instead it really of is, yeah. 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 I'm going to pop up a couple of the close-up um, images here of the ones that are sitting behind you. These are just beautiful. This is, uh, it, it reminds me of a Japanese bonsai. Um, yeah, so that came out of um, the... So Moreland have a end of year show every year for local artists. And last year it was, um, what was it? Solitude and something. Mm. I can't remember. And it was a time we were going through lockdowns and it was that thing about, you know, living in solitude, sitting under a tree, contemplating life, the universe and nothing. Um, and so, yeah, so that's how these pieces came about. And my mother, um, well, she, when she died, she won. She had the largest stash in the world. Um, and in her stash was a lot of copper wire. And I was like, what am I ever going to do with this? Yeah. So an awful lot of her stuff I gave to women's charities that could use it. But there was some stuff that, you know, for whatever reason I kept. And I had a lot of copper wire. And I thought, well, that was kind of that sitting under a tree on a mountain Mm. idea of solitude contemplating your future that sort of thing I can, um, so that's how they came about yeah well they're absolutely beautiful and I, I noticed are these the ones that are up for sale on your website uh yeah most of them um they're either on for view um some of them are in the coming up stitching change so they're the shattered they're all about the fires um and so a lot of my these kintsugi pieces are what I'm showing in the stitching change Mm -hmm. um, which was supposed to open at 45 downstairs on Tuesday, but we're in lockdown. Yes. So, so we're going online. So if anyone wants to join us, uh, you can go to it's nantextile.co and the link the, to the Zoom is on there. We're going to open it at 5 o'clock on Tuesday anyway. Um, and it'll be online, and then we're going to actually still have it at 45 downstairs, but that will be from the 8th to the 19th of February next year. So mm -hmm. we've got 31 artists, um, all from Victoria, and they're all amazing. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to be all showing together, um, connecting. We had hoped to all be meeting each other on Tuesday, but we will meet each other cyberly, um, and it's just a great collection of work and it's I don't know when the work started coming in for the show I was just amazed at how different everyone's work is you know there is yeah. literally no two people doing anything similar it's fantastic oh, so, yeah so um it will go live on the website on Tuesday as well um and it'll stay live and right through till the end of the live show now um but yeah there's some great stuff there. Go and have a look, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's really nice to have that connection. Um, and out of the exhibition, we have a Facebook group and that started, you know, people connecting each other and supporting each other and just giving each other a bit of a, you know, we love you, that your work's great uh, stuff. It's really, really nice to see. And I'm so glad we did it. Yeah. <laughs> Even a bit of a hiccup with having to go online so I've been kind of madly doing we're having a catalogue and the online show which of course won't be nearly as good as the in-person show but it's what we can do so we're going yeah. for it yeah. yeah well I've got it in my diary and we've put all the links up so we've put the link up to the zoom and also the passcode is in the comment section so if people wanted to diarize it um for the 12th um yeah. what time again would you say 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Melbourne time. So wherever you are in the world, it's 5 p.m. Melbourne time. Okay. Um, which is when the opening was supposed to be at 45 downstairs. So we just left it at the same time. 
what does an online opening involve? Like what could people expect if we if we log in? Um, what do we what do we I don't even know what to expect. <laughs> I have no idea either. So what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm putting together a slideshow of all the works. Yeah. Um, and then with each artist, I'll be saying, you know, if you want to talk, just turn on their microphone. Oh, some yeah. artists do, some artists don't want to talk. That's fine. And we'll just be going through. So we'll be going through alphabetically first names yes. um, and just showing their pieces with the photographs they've submitted because obviously I can't take any photographs and stuff at the moment. Oh, yeah. Um, and, yeah, just working through that and then having just an open chat at the end as you would if you were having a glass of wine with everybody in the gallery. So oh, um, really? and we'll just see what happens, basically. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. I think that's what I love the most about, um, you know, the galleries and the openings and then the Q&As is actually like meeting the artists behind the work. For me, that's very yeah. special. Yeah. And I think it's nice because it then, you know, mm -hmm. like by just showing everyone all the pieces. So I'm just going to put up one photograph of each piece. Because yes. uh, we have detail stuff and people can go to the catalogue to find out more about the artists and things like that, which they'll be able to download. Um, but, yeah, and then at the end, if somebody wants to ask anyone a particular question, if they're there, well, they can answer. So, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. See what happens. You know, yeah. I've never done this before, so we'll find out. <laughs> it's like living. And I, I think that we've all got so used to being on Zoom and things and knowing yeah. that, you know, the internet doesn't always work and lighting doesn't work and people unmute themselves and whatever. <laughs> so we're okay, you know. It'll just be yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, fun, hopefully. Lots of fun. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I thank you. I I received your press release and, and that's what prompted me to go, Tamara, I've got to talk to Tamara. And what a great opportunity to be able to promote your your exhibition. So um, part of the press release was that you uh, listed everybody's names and their Instagram links. So I've gone in and liked all their pages and there is some amazing artists and oh, such a diversity. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, like, to me that was really important to make sure that when we were sending out information, people could connect directly with the artists. And, like, if, you know, if anyone is in the opening and wants to buy a piece, they're direct, dealing directly with the artist to purchase a piece. Um, they won't be able to pick them up until after the live show because we've kind of made that deal. But it's basically through the whole show we've made it so that everyone gets 100% of that money because that's really important at the moment because so many people are doing really tough. So, um, yeah, so there's, you know, it's all about supporting each other. So, you will, you know, if you decide you want to buy something, you just contact that artist directly and then that way they can actually, you know, know that you love them. Yeah. That's <laughs> so fantastic. Everyone will love them. Yeah. So, yeah. And generous of the gallery to do that as well. That's fantastic. Well, 45 downstairs are fantastic not-for-profit. So if they're sold in the show, they all they take is their bank charges. Yep. Um, and all the artists who are participating, we've all contributed to put on that show to pay the gallery fees, and we've all paid the same. Um so it's a real group effort and hopefully yeah. everyone will do really well and everyone will like their work and support them into the future. Yeah, I love that. I love a good collaboration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's so important, I think, at this time in particular when we can't go out to actually know that we like each other's work and that we're willing to, you know, share stuff on our feeds from other artists and things like that. Yeah. It's just been fantastic. So. Yeah. Yeah, the tide rises all boats. That's yeah. my belief. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a really good saying. I'm going to remember. Yeah, that. I love it. I, I just, I live by that, you know. I'm not yeah. here to bring anyone down. Let's all rise together. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's so, especially now when we've been, you know, all stuck in our studios, which is, like, to me it's been fantastic because my studio has never been so clean and organised and, you know, <laughs> I've actually got things that I can have as different projects, you know, if I want to sit outside and stitch in the sun, I've got some hand stitching stuff, I've got some machine stitching, I've got some kintsugi stuff on the go. And it's great, but it's still, you you kind of miss that connection. And to me, you know, going to live openings was just oh, the bliss of, you know, I'd go maybe once every fortnight or something to a live and missing that is just, 
Yeah. Mm. I'm just looking forward to it coming back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. It's all those little incidental conversa conversations yeah. you have that's not planned or somebody randomly bumping yeah. in. That, that's what I miss as well. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, like inspiration, just, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about NAM Textile Collective. And um, on, on the statement on the website, it says that uh, what does it, it, it mean to, it was born to challenge the boundaries of textile art practice. What, what, is, what does that mean? So basically what um, the idea, so I set it up um, about two years ago um, as a Facebook group just to try and connect some people um, and get chatting. Um, and just it was originally meant just to be Melbourne, so we'd be local, we could all kind of meet up for a coffee or do something. Um, and then when I started the show, it was I realised that a lot of the people who were actually had connected to them weren't actually in Melbourne. They were in Ballarat. Well, a lot of them were, but they were, they were in Ballarat. There's, uh, you know, they were in Warrnambool, they were up in Mildura. They were all over the place. So that's, so NAM is actually the Indigenous term for the region of Melbourne. Um, and I'm just not going to change the name, but we're now all Victoria because it was so many people wanting to connect. And it's just about keeping it local and small. So we're not trying to be, you know, um, a, a huge group who is worldwide or anything like that. We do have members now who come from all over the world who have picked it up, with, however, through Facebook. But um, it's just, it was about that connection. And that's why the show Stitching Change was very much, you had to live in Victoria. Um, it was about connecting. And there's a similar uh, group, Seed Stitch, in New South Wales, oh, who connect New South Wales artists. Um, and that was part of where I got the idea, is that there was this fantastic group in New South Wales and we didn't have anything. Um, and so it was just about, yeah, it's about connecting, um, chatting, patting each other on the back, giving each other information and just helping each other um, in any way we can, or, you know, being silent if you just want to sit and watch. It doesn't matter. Um, but it's just a really nice, safe space. Um, and it's not about a really big thing. There's no real rules. If people want to post, they can post because it's a nice small group. We don't have to think about... Um, you know, people putting up too many posts or trying to sell their stuff or whatever. So far, that's never happened. Um, maybe we'll change if it does. But at this point, it's just a nice little small group of really, really lovely people. Yeah. Well, that's gorgeous. You know, you don't need many, do you? You just no, need... I think it's about that. Yeah, keeping it small, people are getting to know each other. Yeah. And through the show, we were all going to meet each other. But like, next year, next we will. Year. Yeah. So Something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a time of connection. We all just want to connect and help each other. Yeah, so, that's yeah. beautiful. Well, congratulations. You're doing a great thing and that's wonderful. Good on you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mendit Australia asked, said, hello from Melbourne as well. Great to see Tamara's work featured. Oh, <laughs> she said, when were you in Japan, Tamara? Uh, so 1978, I went to school there for a year when I was 16 uh, in Yokohama. And then I went back um, when I was about 22 for six months and just travelled around. Um, so, yeah, just a great place. And the joy, uh, like I haven't been back, so I had planned. So my sister's big thing was she wanted to do this big last trip through Japan. So we were going to do that. But... Um, well, she passed away and then we went into shutdowns. <laughs> oh, yeah. So one day I'll get back. You will. You will. Absolutely. The lovely Doreen Lyon asked, um, what is the New South Wales group? I think it was Seed Stitch. Oh, Seed Stitch. Yeah, Seed yeah. Stitch. So they do a yearly show. Um, I think it's, year, it's either yearly or biannually. I can't remember. But it's, it's at the Design Centre in Sydney. They do a show because they're sponsored by the Design Centre. Um, and they're a lovely group, amazing group. They just do beautiful stuff. So if you're in New South Wales, Seed Stitch, go to them. Yeah, look, check out. They have, um, last time I looked, their website was down, but um, I imagine they do something out through it. But, yeah, really nice yeah. group. 
Gorgeous. Well, I'd love to still want to showcase more of your work because there's lots more to show, if that's okay. And Absolutely. some of your beautiful, like when I was looking through the images that you sent through of your um, embroideries, they're just beautiful. They reminded me of impressionist paintings. Like, and I don't know what it was, but I think it's the way, you, it's not when you look at it like close up, but it's when it's on the screen and you're looking at the light and the way you dapple light and the threads that you've used. It, they could be impressionist paintings. They're beautiful. Um, <laughs> I'd love to for you to share us a little bit about um, about some of these pieces and um, maybe a little bit about how you uh, often use photographs as your starting point and then how you can explain how the work comes about. Yeah, yeah. So, um, year, oh, gosh, too many years ago, probably about 35 years ago, I did a, a fringe sheen embroidery course in England and it was about painting on interlining and then machine embroidery on that in an abstract way. And I really enjoyed that, had a great time, um, but I'm that person who's really irritating on holidays and at family things who likes taking lots of pictures. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was trying to work out a way I could make my pictures into the machine embroideries. So originally I started out uh, so that one there is I've had the picture in front of me and I've just gone for it um, using, so I've used an organza for the sky to give it that sparkle and then machine embroidering and that was up, a photo taken up in Queensland when we were over here from the UK um, on a holiday and there was just these amazing red roads, you know, just kind of yeah. going through um, and the fences and stuff. So. The problem with that one, it's not a brilliant photograph because it was before, you know, we had these amazing phone cameras and things. Yeah, but, you know, I like it. I, I like guess, it. Yeah, so it's kind of got this really nice, and, and that one actually won an award um, a few years ago, which was really nice. Um, it was for Australian Outback. Um, and it's just, yeah, playing with it. So this one is taken in the south of England and it's an old lighthouse um, and it's got, the estuary coming through. So with this one, I, I was actually um, experimenting with T-shirt transfers. So I took the photograph, and this one's quite large. Um, I took the photographs and then tried printing them on T-shirt transfers and then putting them onto Calico. And you can kind of see the seams there. It's actually, it's actually in pieces because to get the, the size up. Oh, yeah. um, and then kind of embroidering over a really washed out photograph. So I'd taken the photograph right back to its bare basics. So you just had the really basic outline on the transfer. Um, and so, yeah, so it was playing with it that way. Um, and it's just getting those colours and playing around and spending a lot of time fiddling with your machine. It's great fun. Um, I love the colours in this one. This is amazing. Yeah, so that was, again, when we were on a trip to Australia, and it's Kuma. It was a sunset. So um, we borrowed my brother's car to go for an hour's drive, and uh, about six hours later from Canberra, we were in Kuma and had to get back. And from Kuma, it's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive to Canberra. So, And we'd gone up through the back roads, and as we were driving down the highway, there was just this amazing sunset. And so there again, I've used the organza to get that healed without having to do too much embroidery and then the grasses and just mainly focus the embroidery on getting the amazing colours of the sunset that day. So yeah. it's kind of those stories and, you know, picking up, um, I think I took about six photographs that day of the sunset, but, you know, you just get that one photograph that just really works. So. Yeah. That one that's and a lot of it is about that. So it's it's either when I'm doing my more photographic pieces, I either have the photograph behind the machine and I'm just embroidering looking at it, or I am still using um, often the T-shirt transfers and ironing them onto Calico. So I put the photograph onto them and then kind of hide that away. So um, there's a one of the boats. Yeah. So there you can actually see the photograph behind the work. So I've left some of the boat and the wall as actually the photograph. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of that playing with it and just having fun. You know? mm. And there are so many pieces that are just 
you know, in the they become jewelry or they turn into something else because they're a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well I love I also love this one I know the image is a little bit out of focus yeah, but, not, yeah. it, but you still get you still get exactly what you're looking at do you know what I mean that's what I mean by sort of that almost like impressionist look feel about your work is that if you squint your eyes when you look at it actually me making it purposefully out of focus you get that you get that impressionist feel this this speckles of light that you get with your organza and I, I certainly yeah. came across for me in in this piece like if you squint your eyes at it and and it just comes it still comes alive it's amazing um, and it, it's kind of that fun of you know playing around and the the surf flags one that was a series of five and again it was a holiday you know we were on the beach and then the wonderful thing about Australia is these fantastic surf flags in summer yeah. and they have that uh, the surfboard there and the guys under the umbrellas and because I lived in England for a long time, when we came back on holidays, it's kind of all fresh and new to you again. It's really nice. So, um, yeah, so it was just kind of playing with photographs and enjoying them and seeing stuff. And yeah. you get t so totally different colours when you've got photographs in the UK and photographs here because the light's just so different. Yeah, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, so yeah. it's lots of fun to play with and you end up with a squillion threads that, you know, you may as well use them all. <laughs> <laughs> and your your actual free motion, well, do you call it free, do you call your free, these vessels free motion embroidery? Yeah, so they're done mm. on a soluble background. Yep. So literally um, those, they were, they were a series of elements and they were done in a hoop on the round and just loads and loads of stitching and then washing it away. Um, and then I use a ball to mould them around. That, that one's I've added wire and beads. Mm. Um, and then I use a PVA glue to actually make sure because I found the first time I made them and then we had a really humid summer and they just kind of melted. <laughs> oh, that's not fair. So now you have to, yeah, so I, I use a really light PVA to actually make it so they keep their shapes. But, yeah, so there's, you know, fire, earth, water, um, what is it? fire, earth, water, air. Yeah, gorgeous. So just getting those colours and, yeah, lots of fun. Um, and this one is it's when the rains came. So it was going through um, the outback after rain. And so the first bowl is sort of before the rains, then when the rains first come and after the rains, the trees were full of colour and everything. Yeah. Um, and using that red earth look to make create the bowls and an old weatherboard. <laughs> well, they're just absolutely beautiful. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your work because you mentioned in your artist statement that making making work for you is a way for you to process things and to to make a statement either about the environment or either about the state of uh, asylum seekers in Australia. Um, and or it might even be something else. And you, you've made these beautiful pieces um, here. Can you tell us a little bit about um, about yeah, this? So, um, so to me, how we treat asylum seekers is really appalling because, you know, at one time or another, most of Australians actually sought asylum here, whether it was through, you know, being 10-pound palms or the post-war immigration blitz or, you know, going right back to the convicts and Captain Cook. We came from somewhere and now to not allow anyone else in to me, you know, unless they're basically privileged, um, mm. is just appalling. So these were done, so there's four shirts. Um, there's a baby shirt which has the story of baby Asher. I don't know if you remember that. It was all in the news. Mm. Um, then there's the child that, you know, so many refugees are actually under 18 and kept locked up. Um, this was back um, going on. So numbers to get refugees are really hard to get. So mm. I did these in 2018 and I could only get the 2012 numbers. Um, mm. And then the, so the women's shirt is about, you know, um, the countries that are hosting refugees and the numbers and how pitiful our numbers are. Mm. And man's shirt is about the 
front side is all the negative rubbish that we hear and the back side are, it's actually the facts. So it was all coming through and putting the messages. Um, this one you can see here, uh, send my children to school. And that image of the child behind bars was actually an image done by a refugee child, um, which I've you know translated. So it was kind of taking that story and turning it into something. So these have had quite a few outings. Um, and then there is also to go with those are uh, two wall pieces, um, which one is square and one's round, and they're the numbers at that time of women and children who are, who are locked up and men and boys. Um, and I just found it just a horrendously sad story and it was my way of depicting it. Um, yeah. And, you know, hopefully creating a story that was on a positive side, you know, like with truth around it. Uh, because our government puts this terrible spin and, you know, it's not whether you're Labor or Liberal, they both do it. They mm. put this terrible spin on, you know, we're all going to be invaded by all these boats and da da But if I'm wealthy and I come by a plane and seek asylum, I'm allowed in and I have a visa within six months. It's just this really, yeah. really bad process. So that was my way of kind of getting the churn out without haranguing my children too much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that idea that that textiles and and this this art form can give us that that me, that medium to be able to to let out what we're feeling um, and thinking, and then also gives these these people and these issues a voice. If you're if you're exhibiting and, and sharing, is yeah. that is that in, when you're creating this type of art? Are you are you thinking about that when you're creating it or is it literally just you needed to get it out of your chest and then spread the word or? Um, I think it's a combination of both. You know, yeah. I need to get it out, um, but it's also by having it as something that people can kind of understand, like the shirts to me were this real thing because you've got a baby-sized shirt, a child's shirt, a woman's shirt and a man's shirt. So it's about a story, it's a family. You know, yeah. we're not locking up just a load of young blokes or whatever that they try and tell us. We're locking up families and we're, we're shut, cutting short people's lives. You know, there are people who are, have been locked up for eight years. It's We complain when we're locked up for, you know, 20, 200 and whatever days. Yeah, um, yeah. They've been locked up for so long and there's boys who are still on Swanson Street in a hotel locked up and they've been there for four years. And to try and disguise it because people were sending the messages and that they put film on the windows so no one can see in and in anymore i mean like what why are we doing this stuff it's insane yeah so, yeah so that was kind of that thing and the whole climate change i've worked in sustainability um in the uk and in australia for government and we've known that this stuff's happening for 25 years and in australia you know, they decided it was all too difficult. So they actually got rid of the climate change department. You know, it's like, <laughs> mm. And then we had the fires and that was how the Shattered series came about. You know, it was trying to say, we can't keep doing this. You know, it's yeah. time to change. Um, yeah. And then there's another one I've done and that's, um, it's it's three pieces of drought, um, well, ocean warming and fire. And they're the things that are going to keep happening. So they're kind of the pieces. But it's, um, yeah, my way of interpreting it and getting it off my chest and hopefully getting it out there so people actually read the message. And I try and be very factual. I don't kind of yeah. do the political side of it as much as I can. I try yeah. and be very factual and get my information off government websites when you can. Um, and so, yeah, it's just... We need to make more voice on this. And yeah, yeah. the children are doing a great job before COVID of getting out and making their voices heard and good on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well done for creating that work and, and giving those those people voices as well. And um, if anyone else out there feels compelled to do the same thing, do it. You know, because yeah. it quite often feels like we don't, we, how can we help? We're just one person. What can we do? Can we write to local government? Can we, you know? 
And there's lots of little messages and, you know, really considering how you vote is really important. Um, yes. And, you know, like I'm not I'm not promoting either Labor or Liberal. They both are supported by, you know, mining and fossil fuels and things like that. It's um, We need to change that. You know, we need to stop these big corporations being able to give our politicians money that skews the picture. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what, one, of, one, of the, one of the sayings that we have in our house is quite often the kids are like, why does this keep happening and why does this keep happening? They go, well, you just follow the money, guys, just follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. If you follow the train of the money, you'll figure out how decisions are quite often made, which is a sad part about it. Yeah, see, I left Australia in 1980. Um, and then moved back here in 2003. And in 88, it was a country, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it was a country that was very much, you know, everybody's kind of had a say in all. By the time I came back in 2003, it was very much about the corporations have the say and the rest of us could go hang. And mm-hmm. that was really weird because I'd spent sort of 16 years odd, you know, saying to people in England, oh, you know, Australia, this wouldn't happen in Australia. I'm like, oh, my God, I was an idiot. <laughs> You're just a little bit behind everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love your art and I think it's amazing and um, keep doing it, keep keep spreading the facts. Mm. And you've obviously got that government you know, know how and, you know, prowess that you can navigate these websites and, and sift through the information and good on you. I yeah, think that's great. Kind of find that, yeah, the, what they allow you to find nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> talk to me Talk to me about this piece, Tamara. Okay, so in, in um, 2018 um, I was diagnosed on Valentine's Day with breast cancer um, and, you know, always wanting to be a bit different. I had two different cancers in the same breast. Um, And these hankies were ones that my mother had given there a set of four. And I used them through my treatment uh, with chemotherapy and radiotherapy and Herceptin and all the other things went through um, to literally, you know, cry on, blow my nose, whatever. And then at the end of it, it was getting it out. So it was, you know, this is a piece called Tears Cried. um, And it was, you know, focusing on, well, the eyes where the tears cried, uh, the breast, you know, how it breaks your heart. Um, On the the, the bottom left, that is actually a cancer cell. And then the top right is how your lymph nodes go through your breasts. so I was very lucky. It hadn't got into my lymph nodes and they were very small. So I was treated and, you know, all is well. So my message now, and I'm very strong about it, is, you know, don't miss your mammograms. No matter what you do, do not miss your mammograms. My sister died of breast cancer. Um, so she had it in 2014. It came back, metastasized all through her body. Um, and she died two years later in 2019. Um, and that was because it was caught too late. So basically, you know, my, my thing to you is do not miss your mammograms. Um, make sure you go in and have them. Yes, they're uncomfortable. Yes, they're not the greatest thing, but it can save your life. And the treatments we have in Australia are amazing. Um, I was really lucky. I got to go into the new Peter Mac Hospital mm. and... I don't know, you know, to be an oncology nurse, you obviously have to be the most perfect person. They were just wonderful. So, yeah, so I just kind of, that was my um, way of getting that out um, afterwards. And when, because it takes a while, while for you, for you to recuperate. Um, so I was just sitting, stitching those and trying to get that message out of, you know, we get free mammograms in Australia, use it it's really worthwhile because the earlier they catch it, the more likely they are to get rid of it. And, I mean, you can't probably see from this way, but I've now got one and a half boobs and that's fine, but I'm probably the only one who notices it looking down, whereas most people looking face on don't really notice. We can't notice. They, you know. Um, I, was, I might do something about it, but as I'm of a certain age, I probably never will. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I think it makes you more special. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so, 
Mm. Yeah, so it's it's kind of that again, you know, a story about trying to convince women that it's how important it is to have your mammograms, look after your health, get your pap smears, do the stuff. We're yeah. really lucky in Australia that we get the most of this stuff for free. So, you know, look yeah. after yourself. It's really important. Wow. Thank you for spreading that message. And um, I'm sure that it, it would have helped someone watching. I'm, I'm positive. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it was one since when I was going up, undergoing treatment, I hid away. I literally... Hmm. It was. I'd said to my kids for years that one winter I was just going to be a bear and hibernate, and that was the year I did it because I had Valentine's. So that whole winter was all the treatments, um, and I hibernated. So I did. I became a bear, and I even became almost as big as a bear because they put you on all these oh, drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's since I'm over it and I'm healthy. It's like tell everyone the message. You know, get in fast and. You come out well. It's yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good on you. Yeah. And especially since we've all been locked down a little bit, I think, you know, the health system, yes, it is under some pressure. But, you know, the the oncology specialists and, you know, the mammogram places, they're still open. You know, you can still. Yeah. Be and then a bit scared that over the last two years, there's a lot of women who will not be caught as early because yes. they're missing their mammograms. That's so, it. Uh, yeah, it's like if it's due, just do it. Just go, yeah. you know. Yeah, do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, really important. Yeah. So, all we've been going. We've been talking almost an hour, would you believe? I just wanted to talk to you um, about your nebula pieces because I absolutely love them. And then I've got one last question and I'll let you go because I know it's one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but your nebula pieces, I absolutely love these. These are gorgeous. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, so they were, um, when I was going my treatment, um, I had a really old iPad of my, that was my mum's, and um, NASA had released all these amazing photographs of different nebulas, black holes, um, all sorts of bits and pieces, and the colours were just so extraordinary. And at the time, you know, you're tired and you don't want to do a lot, whereas these I could pick up and just copy. So I printed off a load of the NASA images and then just started playing around with threads and doing the different nebulas um, and black holes. I've done it. There was four planets I did as well. Um, and it was just a really beautiful way to meditate and just chill out and enjoy it. Um, mm. And, you know, because they was, they're not incredibly large, so I could just put pick them up, put them down and just enjoy the stitching and, you know, recuperate through enjoying it. And by then it was sort of spring, summer, so I could sit outside um, and just stitch. Mm. So thank you, NASA. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Tamara. That was, they're beautiful. I think they're gorgeous. So we we always like to end our uh, Friday feature artist with a, with a little uh, video and a slideshow and everybody who's been watching can um, pop a comment up and thank. So I've got one last question for you, but if people start putting their comments now and say thank you to Tamara, that would be much, much appreciated. Um, it's always lovely to see people's names pop up and, and that little bit of gratitude at the end. But my last question for, for you, and um, when it comes to your textile art practice or, or maybe just life in general, what, what are you most proud of? Um, my children. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? <laughs> uh, I have three very strong, wonderful daughters who are amazing and have supported me through life and hopefully I've supported them. And they all um, allow me to do my thing, which is really, really nice. Um, and I think, yeah, it, through them and their comments um, and their vision on the world, I've been able to see things differently too. We haven't always agreed, but who always agrees with their children. But, yeah, I think um, I'm most grateful for my three amazing daughters. Um, yeah. Well, apples and trees, Tamara, apples and trees. <laughs> so. oh, I'll tell you I'm a total rat bag, so that's <laughs> Oh, I'm sure, but that, that, that's what makes you fun, though. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Tamara, you've got some amazing workshops coming up next year and I know um, they're coming up in June and you'll be announcing them on your website and um, social media. So keep an eye out for them, people. Um, Tamara will be a wonderful person to, to learn from. I'm absolutely positive of that. So. We have lots of fun, yeah. And, you know, I do different workshops in mending and textile art. Um, but my daughter, my youngest daughter is getting married the first weekend of March next year. So I'm on wedding dress duty. So we're, the toil's oh, done. Now we need shops to open so we can buy the materials. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, good luck and enjoy the wedding. That's really special. Oh, can't wait. <laughs> yeah, that's really special. And good luck for all next year and the opening at um, the gallery. The name of the gallery again. It's the 45 Downstairs on Flinders Lane and um, it's namtextile.co um, to come along and the, the Zoom link is on the front page. So. Fantastic. And in the comments come section. Come and see us on Tuesday. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Um, oh, Tuesday, 5 o'clock. Yeah, well, I've got a meeting booked, but maybe I'll have to, maybe we'll. Oh, well, you know, you'll be able to see the show anyway. But it's, um, yeah. the other thing for all you textile people out there is that on the nemtextile.co, we have a links page. If you know of any links I'm missing, please send them through to me. I would love to add them. Yeah, what a great and generous offer. That is so beautiful. Yeah, and everybody knows a link is, is, is worth gold oh. in the digital age. And it helps everyone because we can all find each other. So, yeah. So, yeah. please, get through your links. Good on you, Tamara. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. We've we've certainly been on a journey tonight. We've talked political. We've talked health. We've talked art. Um, you know, Japanese, kid, you know, new textile, textile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've created a new textile kintsuki. It's amazing. So, um, yeah, what a wonderful way to kick it off for this season. So thank you so much, Tamara, again. Thank you. <laughs> Hold See on um, after the slideshow and I'll say a quick goodbye after. Yep. Okay. <laughs>